Picker's Gill's reed frog, Hyperodius Picker's gilly, was a critically endangered species according to the IUCN Red List. And we were very concerned that the species was going to go extinct. We therefore developed a biodiversity management plan for Picker's Gill's reed frog. And this was gazetted in the government gazette in June 2017. And um, Isabella Casey in Wildlife, for whom I work, was designated as the lead agent for the implementation of the plan. The overall goal of the biodiversity management plan is to improve the conservation status of Hyperodus Pickers Gillidy, ultimately to least concern and improve its protection as part of meeting international biodiversity objectives. In other words, the HE targets. The biodiversity management plan has five objectives. The first objective is to create and maintain an enabling environment for some relevant stakeholders to maintain or if necessary or where necessary improve ecological processes that enable the survival of the relevant subpopulation of the species. Objective two was to prioritize key habitats for high Hyperolius Pickers Gilly with regard to the impact of anthropogenic um, activities on the habitat. And according to the uh, ability of landowners and or management authorities to implement management interventions of the most threatened habitats to ensure the survival of those subpopulations. The third objective was to implement habitat management activity through landowner agreements to secure sites to mitigate against the potential impacts of climate change. The fourth objective was to identify and conduct relevant research to provide information re relevant to conservation management requirements, both in situ and ex situ, and to implement population monitoring protocols to determine relocation and rehabilitation requirements and to ensure that these data are fed back into and inform the overall conservation process. And the fifth objective was to develop educational and awareness campaigns to improve public knowledge about Hyperolius Pickers Gilly and the importance of conserving its habitats. Now, we went into a memorandum of understanding with the Johannesburg Zoo because the first thing we wanted to do was to ensure that the species did not go extinct. And so we asked the Johannesburg Zoo to create an insurance population ex situ so that um, we could ensure that the species as a whole would not go extinct. And the second um, purpose we had for um, the captive breeding of the species in captivity was to um, obtain frogs for release to the wild so that we could build up the wild population until it reached the state that it was actually least concern. And um, we are just um, in the first two years of implementation of the biodiversity management plan. And so um, obviously we've got a lot of years still to go, but things are on track. And um, we are um, doing wetland health assessments um, at various sites. And this is done by the Endangered Wildlife Trust, one of our activity uh, partners. Um, there are also alien plant management plans developed and um, management of alien plants has been implemented at various sites. Um, one of the sites that the Endangered Wildlife Trust is working at is um, a site where a lot of poor people live, but they've shown um, happiness uh, to protect and uh, preserve the site where the frog occurs. And so we are greatly um, encouraged by the progress that has been made in this area. It's shown here, these are the wetlands in which the uh, frog occurs. And um, there's a couple of photos here. And what the people have been doing is actually um, growing and planting indigenous uh, plants in the habitat and they are making sure that things such as dumping and illegal land transformation is stopped before um, there's excessive damage to the habitat. So there is quite a lot of on the ground work being undertaken by some of our partners. Um, here 
um, this slide indicates that about a thousand hectares of land has been cleared by, of alien invasive plants at four of the uh, wetland sites that have pickle schools reed frog. And in the process, 75 local jobs were created using funding from the Department of Environmental Affairs um, in South Africa. So again, we have um, a partnership with national government as well as with NGOs such as the Endangered Wildlife Trust. We also have partnerships with um, other private companies who are helping us to rehabilitate wetlands, um, giving us uh, engineering examples that we can follow, should we want, should we, once we get the money, to improve the wetlands where the uh, Pickle Schools reed frog occurs. And this is one example of a wetland where it occurs where um, some uh, engineering um, needs to be done to return the wetland to its former state and to increase the population of the Pickle Schools reed frog. We also find that in some of the Pickle Schools reed frog habitats, people are growing vegetables. And this causes soil erosion and drainage. Uh, of wetlands and so what the Endangered Wildlife Trust has been doing is providing vegetable boxes in which the uh, people can grow their vegetables out of the wetland and this actually increases labor efficiency they don't have to walk to the wetland and go into the wetland each time as well as socio-economic stability and it's been a great success at one wetland called the Isapingo wetland um, where the wetland is surrounded by a poor community who have to grow their own vegetables. Now we have another um, partnership with the National Zoological Garden in Pretoria. And what we did was we collected samples throughout the distribution range of the species of genetic tissue. And these were analyzed uh, by the National Zoological Garden. Um, and what we found from the results was that we could take Pickle Schools reed frogs from any of the known subpopulations and bring them into Pretoria Zoo, breed them, and not really worry about where we release them again because there are no real genetic concerns. So this was a great plus for this work. We also found that at present, um, there is not much genetic inbreeding. There's a relatively high average heterozygosity and all the populations that we know the frog occurs or where we know the frog occurs. And so again, this means that uh, although we have to ensure that the genetic diversity does not decrease in the zoo, and I'm sure Ian will talk about that, at present, um, the genetic heterozygosity is is high and is similar to a demographically stable species. So again, that's something that's in our favor when we want to um, breed frogs in captivity and release them to the wild. Um, now, I'm going to skip over the next couple of slides because uh, Ian will talk about these um, slides. So I'm just going to skip over these. But what we have done also is to monitor the in-situ populations to see whether uh, the in-situ populations are decreasing or increasing. And um, we have recently started that. We have a benchmark site where we have song meters permanently arrayed um, and deployed. Um, and then we have four other sites where we monitor each year via song meters. Now, wh where I come into uh, this program, is to look at translocations of captive bred Pickers Girls Reed Frog to the wild and release of the frogs there. So we are, have started to establish a protocol under the draft new guidelines for amphibian reintroductions and other translocation, uh, conservation translocations. And um, so far, what we have uh, included is where we capture the frogs from for the captive breeding population and we want to do that either in large populations where the frogs that are taken will um, not decrease the subpopulation size uh, drastically or dramatically and also from populations that are doomed that will soon be destroyed by development so we decided um, for the Janisburg Zoo breeding program, we would take them from two populations, the very large Mount Moreland 
froggy swamp population there and the doomed prospectin population here. What's going to happen here is that there's going to be a dugout port um, made. Um, so they're going to create a port there and that will destroy all the habitat for Pickers Gills reed frogs. This is going to happen in a few years time. Um, again, Ian will talk about the captive breeding population biosecurity features, but um, what I wanted to uh, say was that chytrid fungi fungus testing is done by the National Zoological Garden um, and we collect samples in the field at the site of capture and again when the frogs arrive at the Johannesburg Zoo and um, Ian will talk about that further. What we found in terms of chytrid fungus is that um, and again, Ian will probably uh, talk about this, but uh, in the ex situ population, it's very low, the prevalence um, of chytrid fungus, and in fact is only about 1.1%, whereas in the wild, we found that uh, chytrid prevalence was about 5% in uh, the wild population of Hyperolius picus gilli. Now, um, Again, as I mentioned, the genetic considerations showed that individuals from any subpopulation can be released at any suitable site within the native distribution range of the species. Um, we decided to use metamorphs and adults uh, for release because they are the easiest stage to transport the 600 kilometers or so from the Johannesburg Zoo to coastal KwaZulu-Natal, where its natural habitat is. And Adults and metamorphs are really the only stage that can be monitored long term and they can be monitored via calls and we had hoped via visible implant elastoma markings. So we were going to release uh, the frogs back at the two sites where we had obtained them, they were the parental generation, so as to um, put back at least what we had taken out of the populations. but. We decided against releasing them at the Prospectin wetland because it was dry at the time and also it was going to, in a few years time, uh, be dug up. So we released the 280 month old Pickles Gulls reed frogs at the Mount Moreland Froggy Swamp site. And this was done in September 2018. We did some at a ceremonial site in the late afternoon. This was because it was done in front of dignitaries and the press. We wanted to publicize this. Um, that's part of the uh, Pickers Girls Reed Frog Biodiversity Management Plan, as in, uh, indicated in the earlier slide. But the, the majority of the frogs are released at night at a second release site. So, this is Froggy Swamp in the coastal area of KwaZulu Natal. The ceremonial release site, we released 60 frogs, as indicated there. Whereas most of the frogs are released at the nocturnal release site here. At the nocturnal release site, we monitored on several occasions to try and um, observe the marked release frogs. Now, the frogs were released with visible implant elastoma in their thighs um, of a certain color, depending on where they came from, either uh, Mount Moreland or Prospectin. And um, so we went out and walked transects through the nocturnal release site area, trying to find these frogs. And in fact, we couldn't find any. Um, and we don't know whether this was because the frogs had dispersed, as does sometimes happen, whether the visible implant elastoma had um, uh, come out, that the skin maybe had not uh, healed and that the elastomate had come out, or whether the young frogs who, that are not sexually mature at 18 months old um, were actually hiding in the undergrowth, were not crawling because already there's a, a large population of mature adult males there, and so we just couldn't detect them and therefore find them again. We've only uh, observed one of the release Pickers Gulls reed frogs so far, and this has been at the ceremonial release site. 
So again, we have to go back and uh, monitor this summer, which is starting now, the rains have fallen, and see whether we can find any more of the marked frogs. A second site that we chose to release uh, Pickersgill's reed frogs that have been bred in captivity is known as the Riverhorse Valley Release Site. Um, it's indicated here. The reason why we released them here is one of our partners had um, rehabilitated much of this wetland and in fact are still rehabilitating this wetland here. And another feature was that the type locality of the species is about four kilometers to the northeast along the same river system. This type locality has been destroyed by development. So we are hoping that the uh, frogs that we, we release here will breed and eventually the species will disperse back to near the type locality so that we still have frogs at the type locality. Um, we decided to release 50 mature frogs here because we determined that there were no Pickersgill's reed frogs here at the time of the release. And um, we are hoping that through monitoring and through calls, we will be able to determine the success of the release at uh, River Horse Valley. What we have found so far, we've just done one monitoring. We have actually heard one Pickersgill's reed frog there, but the time um, of the monitoring was quite early in the season. It's been very dry, very few frogs of any species were calling at all. So we are happy that we heard one of the Pickersgill's reed frogs, but again, with the rains just uh, having fallen now, we hope to go back and do uh, more thorough monitoring there over the summer. Um, one, uh, the other objective that I mentioned was to develop education and campaigns. And so um, the Janisburg Zoo has produced posters on the Pickersgill's reed frog, um, various posters looking at the nutrition, the kite fungus, and its life cycle. The Endangered Wildlife Trust has been working with school children and um, teaching them about the frog and about wetlands and ecology of the wetlands. And the pupils have also gone out to the wetlands to see the habitat that the Pickersgill's reed frog lives in. Um, the Endangered Wildlife Trust has also been looking at nature guide learnership and development of a Quasilla Natal frog route where people can be taken to uh, see these frogs, to the habitat of the frogs and to see them. And also the guides know about the other frogs in the area. So um, they um, may actually derive some economic benefit from that as well um, through tourism. The Endangered Wildlife Trust Leap Day for Frogs um, in February this year attracted about 3,000 people um, and um, Pickersgill's reed frog or were one of the frogs that were um, talked about in the Leap Day for Frogs and this is a program that is, runs countrywide in South Africa. And we've had various um, media coverage, both social media and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and that type of thing, online and also in uh, television, both national, South African television and international, such as CNN, and also in newspapers. So we have tried to publicize the uh, implementation of this biodiversity management plan for Pickersgill's reed frog um, widely. So yeah, that's it from my side, but uh, what I do want to say is that the Johannesburg Zoo has been crucial in this uh, biodiversity management plan because they have provided the insurance population, they've developed an insurance population, and they have, are also providing captive bred frogs for release to the wild. And so um, I'm very happy with our collaborative partnerships, um, particularly with the Johannesburg Zoo, but also with our other partners such as the Endangered Wildlife Trust and the National Zoological Guard. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this great opportunity. Um, Dr. Adrian Armstrong have explained quite a lot and uh, the teamwork is phenomenal with the um, partnerships on a national basis in South Africa. There's a numerous um, frogs. It's part of this um, agreement where the Pickers Guild was the first one that's actually introduced. So what I'm going to do is just to take you through a couple of photos showing what we're doing at the zoo 
And um, before I start, just want to elaborate as well that we were very excited to find and to hear the frogs um, this season already calling from the ones that we released on sites that there were no previous records um, done. So it actually proves that what we're doing definitely got a great result. Um, and hopefully we can build on that. But um, let's quickly look at the, at the photos I've got to show everyone. Okay, let me just quickly. Right, the Johannesburg Zoo Amphibian Research Project was initiated in 2006. So it's already a 13 year project. Um, it was after the information came through after the Panama scenario with chytrid fungus. And then the zoo decided to basically dedicate resources and commitment to the conservation of amphibian species and to establish insurance populations for South African amphibians. Now a number of non-endangered species were chosen in the beginning to first to get into the field, train staff, get protocols up and running, ensure that the SOPs are um, basically applicable and to ensure that we can actually breed and maintain before we just jump into the deep side um, with endangered and critically endangered species. With great success that we have achieved with five species, we have decided to contact KwaZulu-Natal, Dr. Adrian Armstrong, and said that we are ready for moving on to the endangered species. The first endangered species that was decided on was the Picus gill reed frog, Hyperolius Picus gilli. So before we can actually do that, a memorandum of agreement was signed because it's government to government, as well as we have to set out um, the responsibilities. The enclosures, the um, biosecurity facility were basically um, completely fixed up and prepared for the new level. So we had to look at the husbandry of, of the species as it's the utmost importance. We had to look at the requirements and can we provide the necessary veterinary care, food supply, enrichment programs, and to ensure that it's all compiled and collaborating with the biodiversity management plan um, that is set out and Dr. Adrian Armstrong have shown you guys as well. So we decided on a project plan. Um, it's a bit small. If anyone wants it, I'm willing to share it. But it's basically from step one, from literature to further research, to building enclosures, finding out if the husbandry will work, water qualities, environmental qualities, the mimicking, the record keeping, the fungal treatments, the collaboration, everything in detail was basically designed step by step and it was basically approved. With that, we had decided it's time for the Pickersgill reed frog. Now, as you can see, and also in the previous slides with Dr. Adrian, it occurs in KwaZulu-Natal, so it's an endangered species. It was critically endangered. It's now classified as endangered, and it's endemic to a small area in KwaZulu-Natal, no more than 20 kilometers inland from the ocean, and about 25 wetland sites known. So it's a very, very small um, niche that they prefer. So we found out, we learned a lot, and we also realized that the Hyperolius marmoratus that we used as a pioneer platform, there's a lot of differences between these, even though they're all Hyperolius, but the platform was set and we decided we're gonna um, bring a few in. So we collected 20 specimens in uh, basically in 2017 and we implemented of introduced them into the program. And as Dr. Adrian said, about 18 months later, we already had the F1 generations and we had them through, took them through an entire program for pre-release. And it has shown that they can definitely survive after release. There you can see a small of an adult male and on the, the one with the green at the back, the female. The biodiversity management plan, the guideline for this project, um, as Dr. Adrian said, he is the coordinator for this project representing the entire country and Johannesburg Zoo is currently the only ex situ breeding facility um, at the moment with the National Zoo helping us with any genetic work and fungal work um, and then Endangered Wildlife Trust that's also our ground team that's doing phenomenal work in the ground and site. So we had to look at numerous things, biosecurity facility um, to ensure that it's completely escape proof. There was nothing supposed to go in and out because these frogs do not occur in Gauteng in the central part of South Africa. Um, what is the security for staff, gloves, the uniforms, what can be used to disinfect, what not, how to do it, where to do it, water quality, 
um, how we transport the water from the water purifying source to the enclosures, how we discard from any grey water and any water that's been removed, fecal matter, the drafting and implementing of SOPs was done, the collection and release protocols had to be uh, studied, done, speaking to people around the world, uh, asking what worked, what didn't work, so that we can adapt and learn from that. Um, and then preventative protocols, um, how we do chytrid. Now, as Dr. Adrian said, we, when we do collect the frogs, we swap them on site, bring them to the zoo. They get swapped um, immediately at the zoo again, and about a month later again for chytrid. Fecal samples will get done weekly, and then on the release time, when we start preparing, it's about a two months before release, we'll start the process all over again. And then if everything is cleared from the veterinary side, from the National Zoo side, the permits and stuff in place, we will only then start looking at, at the relocation. So we had a memorandum of, of understanding signs. We had to get our, our permits from different provinces, as well as on a national side. And of course, a very important thing is to get full ethical approval for the project. And with everything basically signed off and approved, it was time to look at putting everything into a husbandry manual. So currently we're in the final stage soon to be published. It's a complete detailed husbandry manual for Pickers Gill Reed Frog from beginning to end collection, breeding, taking care of all the phases. There's about seven breeding phases of, of developing phases. I'll show you soon. Um, so there's going to be a quite a detailed manual on this species soon. Our enclosures in the zoo is called the AIA systems, the amphibian isolated systems whereby we have water circulation, but the Pickersgill reed frog is a um, species of amphibian that prefer low oxygenated water, preferably areas where the spring will start, river systems will start so out of the wetlands, and they're not very a social animal of other amphibians. There's areas that they do coexist with other amphibians where we found them living in isolated pockets. So we basically had to, to keep that in mind with the designing the site, the type of habitat. So what we do is we got a 30 degree angle where these exoterras or the desert den stands on with pebbles in front, water that's stagnating or a very, very, very slow turnover to ensure ammonia, nitrates and stuff is at the zero. Chlorine tests, um, hardness, everything has been tested literally on a continuous basis. The constant record keeping, the egg crating, the leaves for breeding purposes. So this is more or less our breeding facility and housing facility for the metamorphs, the frog lids, as well as the adult breeders. So there you can actually see the facilities. We also use jars for translocation. Um, it works out quite well. We put a very thin um, paper towel inside, sprayed with RO water at room temperature as well as then mark it with small air holes in the, in the screw on lid and we can quarantine specimens like this as well as, as move them for the 600 kilometers from KwaZulu Natal to Gauteng and, and back um, by road and it works quite well. We have never ever lost a single specimen by using these so we definitely know the jaws is a very clean thing. We do change the jaws on a yearly basis so we use them for 12 months and then we basically have to obtain new ones just for biosecurity purposes. However, when we translocate these, we need to be very careful because carbon dioxide is a big problem. So we don't keep more than five to six specimens, adults in a jar, and we constantly clean by basically wiping out, spraying um, new RO and just ensuring that everything is clean inside. So it does work quite well. It's also a very secure way. Field work, there's a lot of monitoring and expeditions that took place. There you can see the Mount Moreland area and the prospecting area Dr. Adrian spoke about and teams that working at night. Interesting fact is that we have done some day work um, earlier this about a month ago and we found quite a lot of them active during daytime. However, they're not calling yet as Dr. Adrian said, but we found them sitting in mid-level of reeds. So it's definitely a scenario that these frogs are active right through. It's not only at night we will be able to find them because the areas that the wetlands is quite dense and it goes quite deep. So the juveniles are staying right at the bottom where the adults goes to mid-level higher. So it's also one of the reasons why we say the 18 month olds would be down because the one that we found with the elastoma were very, very, very low into the reed, almost at water level. And it's extremely difficult to move through these, these, these habitats. So there you can actually see us doing all the field work. So more um, collection, you can see when we do field work, some of the areas that we go into, 
they don't like the, the flowing river of the open rivers and more into the very dense reed areas. As you can see, the photo on top is a zoomed in photo at the bottom. And then when we go out, we do full surveys of um, identification of the geology, the vegetation, any other living creatures that we can find, water quality, um, chemical and bacterial that we study that site and we take samples back. So that's what's everything that's happening even before we, we start looking for the amphibians. Um, plexus in the zoo, when we brought the first few ones back, automatically there was a bit of stress breeding, but we also have learned how to stimulate to encourage breeding during times. So they have not lost the internal clock, um, but there you can see. Now what we have found with this eggs is usually they will go on plexus, and she will lay the eggs and spermination takes place. However, we have seen where the female lays the eggs and she almost go fetch a female, a male, bring him back and then fertilization takes place. But we've also noticed where the female will lay eggs um, when there's a lot of calling, but the male will go and actually fertilize the eggs afterwards. So we are doing further studies on that as well. And all those eggs actually do hatch. Um, so there you can see more photos basically zoomed in this quite small frog of the um, plexus that's taking place. Some of the eggs, so we remove the eggs, they lay it on the glass or the reeds, never in the water, and then we carefully remove it, put it on these relitia leaves, and interesting fact is six to eight days. Today was a very lucky day for us. Our first batch of eggs hatched this morning from this season, and um, we basically out of a hundred eggs, there's one that still needs to hatch and 85 already hatched into healthy tadpoles. So clutches is usually about 100 fertile eggs um, with about an 80% hatching rate. Most of the ones will develop into males. So some of them 70, some of them will go up to 90% males. The rest will be then females. It's very difficult to determine sex for the first six months. Only after six months, we'll be able to see male and female. But the eggs will basically be maintained at a high humidity, but not in water. Um, and as they hatch, we will then separate egg and the tadpoles out of the gel and they will be placed into tadpole jars where they will be a tadpole in our definition for two days and change into developing tadpoles for another six weeks. The one on the right, you can see it's already embryo um, eggs. They can see the hatching taking place. And the photo on top was actually taken this morning, um, a zoomed in photo from a few hours old tadpole that hatched. The photo with the small little tadpoles, that is also basically from this morning. There you can actually see zero to two, um, zero to, to, to one day is basically classified as tadpoles. 24 to 48 hours, they change color into more beige and then 48 hours to six weeks will be developing tadpoles. You can see the color is completely different. They'll start swimming on the sides, um, also upside down. Lung development will start within the first two weeks already, um, as well as then as the leg starts developing. You also find that the fecal matter will be curled in the beginning phases and go more straight as the tadpoles grow older. This is how we basically keep the tadpoles, very still water, low oxygenated water, and as they grow with pebbles and stuff to hide, it's a de-stressor um, at the moment and it works quite well. Okay, one thing that we found that was actually a bag, but we've corrected it. If you can see the one got lettuce, the one don't. So it's blanche remain lettuce. We put it in, but we realized the frog or the tadpoles enjoy it so much, but they just lie and eat. They don't exercise the legs. So delayed muscle development was a cause of this. We decided to remove it and continue with a mixture of, of fish flake and spirulina, um, very, very finely crushed. And we fed them and we realized that the frogs will be jumping much quicker and better and further and higher without the lettuce than what we feed the lettuce because they have to use the legs to push forward and feed from the floating um, algae replacement. So the lettuce is definitely um, discontinued. They can actually see the development that we realized, number one to four in the development is how the legs developed. There are one or two frogs that's slightly different, but 99%, this is the, actually the sequence they will follow because they will swim onto the heavier side and then suddenly they tipped around when the leg is out and then they will go around. The developing phases that we got there with the nice big female in the middle, we, will, we actually classify them as adults, go to eggs, tadpoles, developing tadpoles, metamorphs, froglets, and young adults. And then the young adults will be your 18 month old specimens. 
Okay, the metamorphs and frogs, just a few photos there, how you can see they're developed. So there you can see the ones already climbing on the rocks, the, the basically nice color, the absorption of the tail, it's definitely absorption. We've measured it, we weighed them. Um, so it's very, very interesting to see, but I'll show you guys some photos later, but this is our metamorphs. So at this point in time, they already start with color changing because there's about four colors they can go. Male and female will, will change later on, but throughout the entire life, they can change color from lighter to darker or from white brown um, to even a lime green. There you can see the female and the males and the colorations um, as adults. The elastomers that we put in and then the releases, Dr. Adrian said, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Just future things. There's another 50 that's now busy getting prepared for release also in um, Horse River Valley. And then from there on, 400 will be released every single year. We are just looking at the VIE as to see if it's not, um, if you haven't put it in at a much earlier life stage than um, a month or two or three months before release. Okay, release public awareness and public education, definitely with government involved, national media, as Dr. Adrian said, so I'm not going to talk much about that. That was some of the releases, the translocation and the introduction, this was the introduction, where we moved the frogs and um, introduced them. The monitoring after and the post-release monitoring that's taking place, that photo with the people with the wetland at the back is Adam's mission. Um, what Dr. Adrian spoke about. So you can see the pollution and stuff around. The community is busy assisting to clean it up. And um, this is also one of the areas we will start reinforcing. Some photos of the tadpoles. If you looked at the one at the right hand side, you will see the legs is already developing that side. So we're also using the microscopes for measuring um, growth and developing phases. Identification is still through the mouth part. Right, observation, it's very important. We have people sitting there. You can see me just looking at the frogs for a couple of minutes, but we have students that's basically observing the frogs and look at what's happening at different times, different temperatures, different humidities, with or without UV lights, day or night, and everything is getting recorded to the finest detail so that we can actually have a track record to see how we can improve. You can see the small mouth part there as well as how we will identify with the pillay the specimens. Just about more photos of the observations, the record keeping, education, marketing, public awareness, froggy evenings, um, further studies, and then everyone that's in that's basically interested, school groups, the zoo sees 600 plus thousand people a year, and that is 600 plus thousand people that will be knowing Pickers Gill Red Frog is important for us to ensure survival. Thank you very much.